Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to take a look at this, the Odroid M1 from Hardkernel. This is an ARM SBC designed for long-term availability and it's got a SATA port and an NVMe M.2 slot, both of which are, in theory, bootable. So, let's go and take a closer look. Right, here we have our exciting box containing the Odroid M1, specifically an 8GB model. So uh, let's open it up. Easy to get in, I think. There we are. Oh, attention, what does it say? Oh, it's a warning about uh, electrostatic handling and that type of thing. That's, that's important. We have a uh, little battery, CR2032, presumably the real-time clock battery. And here, we can get it out. Let's get rid of that. Ooh, down on the floor. We've got the board itself. Oh, it's sealed. We'll have to bring in Mr. Scissors. Here he is. Just to get into the uh, into the bag. You can give it a snippety snippety snip. Is that letting us in? Yes, there we are. Thank you, Mr. Scissors. Here we have our brand new single board computer. And it's got the familiar design we've seen from Odroid many times in the past now, a massive heatsink on the base of the board. I do like that design. And I think the first thing we should do here is to compare this with another Odroid SBC, which is this, the N2 Plus, which I reviewed in October 2020. So let's put the M1 down next to the N2 Plus. As we can see straight away, they are the same width, although the M1 is longer. And it's important to note that the M1 is not a replacement for the N2 Plus. So let's consider the differences. Starting with price, the M1 is $70 for a 4GB model and $90 for 8GB. Meanwhile, the N2 Plus is $66 for 2GB and $83 for 4GB. So the M1 is cheaper with the same RAM, at least when purchased directly from hard kernel, although I'm going to say a bit more about pricing later in the video. In terms of SOC, the M1 has got a quad-core Rockchip RK3568B2, whilst the N2 Plus has got a hexa-core Amlogic S922X. This means that the N2 is more powerful, although the M1 has got a neural processing unit and we can purchase it with more RAM. In addition, the M1 has got more connectivity. In particular, it has got a camera and an LCD screen interface, and it's got a SATA port and an M.2 slot, which can take an NVMe SSD. Both the SATA port and the NVMe slot are bootable, and there's also onboard firmware called Pettyboot for selecting and installing operating systems, which of course we'll be checking out later in the video. So, let's now turn to the M1's full specifications, and here the SoC and the RAM are under the board in contact with the heatsink, and it's worth pointing out as an aside, there are eight holes on the heatsink, as we can see here and here, and these holes are M3 threaded, so you can use them to mount things to the board, or indeed to mount the board itself. Anyway, under here, our RK3568B2 has four ARM Cortex-A55 cores clocked at up to 2 GHz, as well as an ARM Mali-G52 MP2 GPU at 650 MHz. The NPU is then rated at 0.8 tops, or trillion operations per second, and the 8 GB of RAM is low-power DDR4. If we turn the board back the right way up and make it happier, there we are. We can see on the main short edge that we have gigabit Ethernet and a full-size HDMI 2.0 port that offers 4K output at up to 60 frames a second. We then get two Type-A USB 2 ports, two Type-A USB 3 ports, and a barrel jack for power that requires a 12 volt 2 amp supply. Finally, under the USB 3 ports, we find this micro USB 2 port which is labelled by hard kernel as device only, and which can be used for writing an image to a drive. Talking of drives, behind these ports we have the M.2 slot. This is M keyed for accepting an NVMe 
SSD and it's specified as PCIe 3.0 two lane. And it's also great to see the driver mount directly on the board, which it doesn't on some ARM-based SBCs, as you might recall. Sometimes the M.2 drive sticks out the side of the board. Doesn't do that here, nice and safely on the board. And we've even got down here an M.2 indicator LED. If we look to the other end of the board, there's quite a lot going on, including a 40-pin GPIO connector, our CSI, our camera serial interface connector, and our DSI, our display serial interface connector, which supports a 1280x800 LCD screen. Over on the other side, we then find the holder for our real-time clock battery and an IR receiver, which has got slightly bashed. They often do on single-board computers. It's slightly at an angle. I'm not going to risk bending it back again. And then we also have here a micro SD card slot. The card fits in here and power and reset jumpers. Finally, we have a UART connector and then most excitingly, we've got a SATA 3 port and a 5 volt SATA power connector. If we focus in on the very edge of the board, we then find this socket for an EMMC flash module and a reset switch for the SPI flash, which is mounted just behind it. We then have a 1.3 watt mono speaker output. There's a welcome novelty. And next to that, a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, just like you don't get on an iPhone. This said, the Odroid does have its own emission because there's no wireless connectivity on this board. There's no Wi-Fi, there's no Bluetooth. So if you want to connect to the wonderful cyber world, you either have to use the Ethernet port or a Wi-Fi dongle. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Hard Kernel do sell a rather nice blue metal case for the M1. It costs $9, we're looking at it here. And returning to pricing, I'd note that the M1 is expensive in the UK, with Odroid Co. UK charging £113.30, including VAT for the 4GB model, and £129, including VAT for 8GB. Meanwhile, in the United States, a Meridroid currently charge a far more reasonable $84.95 for 4 gigabytes and $104.95 for the 8 gigabyte Odroid M1, although this is still more than on the Hard Kernel website. So if you want to get this board, it's well worth shopping around. Greetings. Here I am back again, and I've now fitted my long-suffering WD Black NVMe test SSD, as well as putting in the real-time clock battery, and I plugged in the power adapter and all the usual accoutrements. So let's turn on the power. And we don't currently have an operating system on this board, but it'll still boot up into petite boot, as you can see. And this is a utility for helping us set up and manage operating systems. I'll just go to system information at the top first, just because I'm curious. There we are, it shows us our system information. I can presume the escape back again, I can. We can look at system configuration, the way it's going to boot. We can set a boot order, as you can see, very handy. But for now, what I want to do is to install an operating system from the internet. And to do that, I'm going to go down to exit to shell like that. There we are at the bottom. I'm going to enter UDHCPC and enter. And then netboot default like that, and finally exit. And there we are, at the top of the screen, we now have several options to install an operating system using the Netboot installer. And I think we'll start with the first one, Ubuntu 2204, sounds good to me, we'll enter on that. And I won't show you every single part of the install, we'll speed on through, and I'll just stop at anything of consequence. And we're now at the stage of setting up our drive. I'll use the entire M.2 drive down there. Oh, and this is interesting. It's now telling us that the core of the system has been installed and we can now select what else we want. And as you can see, there's lots of options, including things like a, a new Ubuntu Mate desktop down there. But I think I'm going to go for a standard Ubuntu desktop. And after about 14 minutes in the real world, the installation has completed, so we can continue. And in theory, the computer should reboot 
into Ubuntu 22.04. This looks rather good, doesn't it? We can see at the top it lists Ubuntu 22.04. There is a count at the bottom, which uh, will complete. We'll just let it do its own thing. We won't touch anything. And uh, there we are. Something is now happening. Very exciting. And yes, here we are. It looks like we can now log in. And here we are arriving on the Jammy Jellyfish, the Ubuntu 2204 desktop, where as usual on the first boot, we have the welcome wizard has run up. So I just need to deal with all the stages of this. So I'm going to get on with that. And I'll also make my usual scaling changes so things read better on video. And I'll come back to you after that. Right. Here I am back again with the Jammy Jellyfish. I've been testing things out okay. I've not managed to crash this yet. So let's have a look around. And I think we'll start out by going to uh, applications down there and running up System Monitor. Some of you like to see that. So uh, there we are. Didn't come up incredibly quickly, did it? But it is, it is running. We can see our four CPU cores up there, not doing a great deal at the moment. Quite a lot of memory is being used. Not quite sure why, but there we are. But as you can see, things are working. And I know you'll want me to go into a browser, so I will. This machine is very much intended for embedded applications, storage type work, things like that. But we will show you what goes on in the browser and of course, trying to run a YouTube video. But as I think you're gonna guess already, this isn't gonna be spectacularly impressive. But uh, anyway, it's managed to get to the Explaining Computers website. And I'll just go to YouTube just because some people want to see my standard test clip, but I'll tell you in advance, it really isn't going to be very impressive, but uh, we'll just give it a quick run up. There we go. It took me a second to get to there, but uh, hopefully it'll start doing something now. But uh, as you can see, most frames are dropped. This really is not a machine to use as a media player, certainly not if you're going to be running Ubuntu desktop, as you can see. I'll keep my mouse still not to make things worse, but clearly, this is not a machine for video playback, as we can see. So uh, let's come out of this and look at some drive-based stuff, which is what this machine is much more suited for. So uh, let's go into a terminal. There we are. And let's first of all list block devices, LS, BLK. We won't find a lot, mainly the uh, NVMe drive down here, as we can see, and all the stuff we get with uh, Ubuntu. And let's also test the speed of the NVMe drive. I'm certainly interested to know what that's going to do. So I've set up already the HD parameters test for that, which will test the drive read speed. So let's execute the test. And of course, it'll want my password. And here we go. Very exciting. What are we going to get? This drive can do about 3,500 megabytes a second. We have just over a third of that 1239 megabytes a second as the speed of the NVMe SSD, which is clearly not impressive compared to the speed of a drive, but this is a two lane NVMe slot, and this is a very impressive drive read speed on an ARM SBC. Right, I've now connected this Kingston two and a half inch SSD to the M1 via a SATA cable, and for power, I'm actually participating in a new Olympic sport to use as many cables and jumpers and adapters as possible to uh, get power to a drive. Anyway, it works for this test. So if we go across to the desktop, here we are still running Ubuntu 2204, where I thought we'd test the speed of a connected SATA drive. So let's run the test. There we go. Very exciting. What's the result going to be? I'm being impatient. And oh, there we are, 380, nearly 381 megabytes a second. That's not bad. Well beyond the speed of SATA 2, nowhere near the speed of this drive, which is around 460 megabytes a second, but good for a SATA port on an ARM SBC. And since I saw you last, I've been experimenting with other operating systems here on the Odroid M1. For a start, if we just close that down, we'll go across to a browser over here. We've got Firefox running. And this is the wiki page for the Odroid M1 showing us the available software, which includes an image for Android. And I've tried to get this working. It's not available to install directly over the internet, but you can download an image, use Etcher to write it to a drive, which I did. But unfortunately, I couldn't get the thing to boot up. Maybe it was me, but I couldn't get this to work. 
but what I have done is to install Debian using the same process I showed you earlier on in the video. So let's boot into that. Let's just uh, close down here and uh, restart and uh, restart like that. There we go. And here we are booted up again back into Petit Boot. Well, as you can now see at the top, we can boot into either Ubuntu 22.04 on the M.2 drive or into Debian, which is on the SATA drive. So let's select that. Here we go. I like this Petit Boot system. Very good for moving between operating systems. Fantastic to have this on an ARM SBC. And here we are arrived in Debian. Just go put in my uh, username and password, which are nice and secure because you can't see them, which is a little bit worrying, but it does work. And uh, there we are. We're now arriving on the Debian desktop. And performance here is very similar to what we had in Ubuntu 22.04. The YouTube playback's no better, but I just thought I'd show you I've got another operating system running, which is rather good. And let's bring up, for example, the task manager. In fact, just before we do that, note this is rather laggy. This is not as good as the Ubuntu uh, system. But anyway, let's just bring up the uh, task manager down there like that, just to give you an idea what is going on. There we are. This is what's going on in Debian with my selected XFCE desktop on the Odroid M1. The Odroid M1 may have a great future. Its bootable SATA and NVMe M.2 port, coupled with the Petit Boot firmware, are excellent, and Rockchip guarantee the availability of the SOC used on the board, the RK3568B2, until 2036. And in turn, Hard Kernel have said they're going to be making the M1 for a very long time. And that's got to be good in terms of software development. It gives developers an incentive to develop for the board. And I'm therefore crossing my fingers we're going to get support in major Linux distros for GPU accelerated video playback in the future. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.